Welcome to a conversation with Dr. Bruce Graver, Professor of English at Providence College. A conversation about uh, the John Greenleaf Whittier collection donated to the Providence College Library by Professor Graver in 2009. Uh, Professor Graver, would you uh, uh, speak to us please about uh, the John Greenleaf Whittier collection and uh, how and why you gathered this collection? The how is the how is probably gen or the why is probably genetic. That is, I come from a family of collectors. I've collected things. My parents' house is like a museum, and um, and I have uh, and I was in the process about ten years ago of uh, doing some work on a man by the name of. Tickner, an American scholar by the name of Tickner, who happens to share a last name with the with the um, prominent 19th century American publishing firm of Tickner and Fields. And in doing some searches on eBay for Tickner material, I, I found a lot of Whittier first editions uh, showing up for very little money, like $5 a piece. I floated a few bids. They they were successful, and that's how the and that's how the collection began. Now, after that, I started worrying about why is this happening? That is, why is this Whittier material coming up so cheaply at this time? And there are a couple of different things to say about that. First of all, in the 19th century and throughout the first half of the 20th century, Whittier, Longfellow. Oliver Wendell Holmes, James Russell Lowell, they were the great figures of 19th century American poetry. After 1950, though, their reputations collapsed, uh, partly because, especially in Whittier's case, he didn't write obscure poems that freshman English majors can write five-page analyses, analyses of. He wrote poems that were meant to be able to be understood by people who read newspapers. And consequently, he stopped being interesting to the scholarly community, and people stopped reading him almost altogether. Now, this put to get, created sort of an interesting situation in the 1990s. Through the first half of the 20th century, people who were serious readers of poetry uh, and popular readers of poetry collected Whittier stuff. They all did. And um, they started to pass away in the late 20th century. And those collections wound up not in dealers' shops, book dealers' shops. They wound up on eBay, in flea markets, essentially. And so I started pulling stuff up. Now, at the same time, Whittier has had some of the best bibliographical work done on him of any American writer from the 19th century. So you had a way of going to books and going to various bibliographical resources uh, and finding stuff out, what's rare, how many copies there are, where they're located, uh, things of that sort. And it became very easy to pick and choose carefully on eBay uh, of a wide variety of, from a wide variety of different things, such as manuscript letters. Uh, Whittier wrote thousands of letters Many of them are just thank you notes. He was, a, he was a public figure. He had people writing him thank you notes for poems. He had people writing, sending him little poems that he wanted them to evaluate. And most of the time, he answered these things by hand. So there are thousands and thousands of his letters out there. Uh, three volumes have been published. But in those three volumes, even the editor says he isn't publishing a third of what's out there. So these letters were showing up. $10, $50, $100 sometimes. Uh, I think I might have paid as much as $250 for one letter. And the valuation on those things is, is considerably higher than that when you, when you look at it from a, a kind of uh, historical and literary historical especially point of view. So that's kind of how things happened. Things kind of fell together a little bit by accident. I was drawn per, to Whittier, I think, because I do have uh, some Quaker heritage myself. And I was also drawn to Whittier because I remember my grandmother 
saying that, well, I'm a Wordsworth scholar primarily. And she says, well, I like Wordsworth, but my favorite poet is John Greenleaf Whittier. And my grandmother is one of these small town Indiana literary ladies who, who belonged to the, to the literary society. And, and that was kind of a, anyway, that's kind of a touching little bit of my, of my past that probably helped promote this. Who uh, uh, in the scholarly community might be interested in these uh, uh, these items, these collections, both students and uh, uh, more senior scholars here at Providence College and elsewhere? Well, the first thing, and this is the most important, I think, uh, important thing to know about Whittier as a political figure. He regarded himself as a kind of political poet for the first 60 years of his life, 60, until the end of the Civil War. Beginning in 1830, in the early 1830s, he was devoted to the abolition movement. He signed the original charter of the abolitionist movement in this country. He said that that was the thing he was proudest of in his whole life. That signature, he said, was worth all of his poems. Um, from that point on, he established himself as the poetic voice of the abolition movement. And he not only edited abolitionist papers, uh, newspapers, uh, he also uh, ghost wrote uh, slave narratives. Uh, he also wrote protest poems about various kinds of slave abuses. Uh, he, and, uh, he, he almost got stoned once in New Hampshire. Uh, he was, his offices were burnt to the ground in Philadelphia. And in fact, there's a funny story about him having to disguise himself as a rioter in order to sneak into his office while it was being set ablaze in order to, in order to sneak out with all of his papers. So um, he's a major figure in the abolition movement. Um, he was also, as part of his place in the abolition movement, a major figure in the formation of a new political party in opposition to, uh, to the Democratic Republican Party uh, that was largely agrarian, southern, and pro-slavery. Uh, Whittier tried to assemble out of the ruins of the old Whig party. Uh, first of all, uh, some kind of party that would be specifically anti-slavery, and eventually he was one of the backroom movers and shakers that put together what became the Republican Party in 1856. Um, he was instrumental in convincing Charles Sumner to uh, run for the US Senate, I believe to succeed Daniel Webster. He was instrumental in uh, the Fremont campaign in 1856, the unsuccessful Fremont campaign. His poem, The Panorama, was actually read at Fremont political rallies. And since it's a several hundred line poem, you kind of <laughs> kind of wonder what these rallies were like. But you know, back in those days, a seven, apparently a 500 line poem uh, read to open up a rally was something like a, I don't know, bringing in the Grateful Dead to get people riled up. I don't, <laughs> it's, I don't, I don't really know. Um, but so politically, he was extremely important. He also got especially after the war, or more involved in the women's suffrage movement, and was, I believe, nominated in 72 um, as the uh, vice presidential candidate for the suffrage movement. Um, but he did not, I think he told me thanks, but no thanks, <laughs> was uh, kind of the long and short of it. So politically, extremely important. Um, poetically, um, and, and I have in the, in the collection a number of items that are associated with this, um, including one of the slave narratives. I've got this wonderful thing, the branded hand, which um, uh, has to do with um, someone in Florida who, was, um, who had helped a slave to escape, who was helping slaves to escape on, on his boat and he got caught and they branded the, S, the letters SS into his hand for slave stealer. And this guy was, uh, um, ran this abolition circuit in the North. 
uh, giving all kinds of speeches and things, and people wrote poems about him. And, and this uh, little pamphlet here uh, was, um, it published his poem, his poem, The Branded Hand, <clears throat> but it also um, was actually published in Ohio. Um, so the Whittiers, you know, got this sort of abolition coverage that's spreading really all over this, all over the, you know, the country, uh, even though he's just living up in New England. The other thing about Whittier as a poet, and I think uh, this is the part that really needs far more attention than it's been given since he's you know, kind of fallen off the literary map. Whittier was a poet of American rural life. Uh, the primary poet of American rural life from uh, throughout the 19th century. Uh, he was well loved because he spoke to the people with the people's language and in language they understood. And he mixed a kind of uh, view of rural life. He was brought up on a farm. He worked on a farm till he was almost 20. Uh, so he knew, what, he knew what farm life was like. And uh, he wrote about it honestly, and he wrote about local customs with a kind of a, almost a kind of antiquarian historian's knowledge that allowed him to preserve a kind of view of rural life, particularly rural life as it existed before the Civil War uh, in rural New England. Uh, that became an uh, important part of the cultural memory for people in towns like Haverhill and Amesbury that used to be all farms before the war and after the war became industrial uh, revolution centers, centers of the industrial revolution. Um, and you have then a kind of an appeal to Americans who remember their rural past but are moving into cities and moving and remember working on farms as children but are now working in factories. Uh, and he's a poet that speaks to them with a clarity uh, that maybe a lot of contemporary poets would like to find, <laughs> you know, if they want to sell their books, <laughs> which you know, nobody buys poetry anymore, right? And nobody reads it except college professors. Well, you know, nobody writes it except college professors. Who would have found that a very, very strange state of affairs? 